All right, folks, here's another frequently asked question that deserves its own video. How do I get into HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts, if I don't have access to a club or school? Now, I covered this a couple of times in live streams, and I made a video about it a few years ago, but it should definitely get an update. And this also applies to other martial arts, or historical martial arts at least, if you want to learn a modern martial art, or one with a living tradition, it's probably better to join a school, and it's more likely that you have one available. But you know, historical martial arts are, even though they're spreading, they're still not as popular as other martial arts, and you, it may be hard to find something. So, step one is double check if there really is nothing in your area. I'm going to post some links down below. One of them is the HEMA Club Finder, so you can look up if there is any HEMA school or a club in your area through Google search, etc. There might be something where you are, but let's assume there isn't. Let's assume there's absolutely nothing. Uh, you know, closest thing is like three hour drive or further, anything like that that's just not practically feasible. What do you do then? Well, you can absolutely start a, a club or school on your own and learn it. I mean, this is how HEMA has started. You know, in the beginning, there were no instructors because nobody has done it because it, there was, you know, the, the tradition was interrupted. Medieval and Renaissance swordsmanship as such simply wasn't taught anymore after a certain time. There were other things like saber fencing and foil and epee fencing, which is not the same as Renaissance rapier fencing. But so, what do you do if you want to learn these things? Now, there are plenty of resources. There are the original historical manuals from the times. You can look the, those up on Wichtenauer, for example. Again, link below. There is quite a collection of sources where you have pictures, if available, and the original text and the English translation. So you can get a lot of material there for free. Many of the historical manuals are also available in printed book format, some with modern commentary, some without. There are also plenty of books written by HEMARC practitioners and instructors. Now, in the beginning, when you're only just getting into it, it's difficult, of course, to judge which interpretations are good and which are less so, but you know, just have to be as skeptical as you can and look up reviews and such. I'll post some recommendations down below of books that I read that I found well-researched and useful and also material from instructors who I know are competent and, and can fight well, all of that. And uh, yeah, so once you get into it, and to the practical aspect of it, there are certain things that you absolutely should do. One of the major things is get one of these, a proper fencing mask. Um, ideally, the ones designed for HEMA, I mean, they, they don't have to be designed for HEMA necessarily, but it's got to be the uh, three weapon rated mesh, you know, for, for uh, epee foil and saber, because there are also ones that are just rated for foil and epee or whatever, which are just have a weaker mesh, and they dent easily. Definitely get this kind of additional protection, the padding on top is very helpful. It also protects the back of the head because this is one of the weaknesses of standard fencing masks. They don't have anything there. They just have this flap here and the back of the head is covered. The back of the head is very, very vulnerable. You can get seriously injured if you get hit on the head. And um, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Some people use things like hockey helmets and it's not, it's not quite ideal. The problem is if you have just some bars in front of your face, a blade may slip through. So if you do thrusts at all, that can be extremely dangerous. Uh, you could improvise, like if you absolutely don't have anything else available and cannot afford it, you could get away with things like a motorcycle helmet. It's got to be a little more cumbersome and awkward, but you could or, you know, riot gear helmet, anything with a clear visor, stuff like that you may be able to get away with, but the best thing is definitely HEMA mask. I'm also going to link to some sources where you can get proper HEMA gear down below. So absolutely do not practice without, especially in the beginning. Like if you just 
do very careful, meticulous technique drills. And okay, that's that's fine for the most part. But as soon as you speed up even just a little bit, put protection on. You can easily lose an eye, get seriously injured or lose some teeth. You don't want that, obviously. So get one of those. That's the most important thing. A gorget would also be very important, especially if you do uh, sparring, even if it's just light sparring, because if you get a thrust in the throat, that can be life-threatening. So definitely a gorget of some sort would be important. Most important, definitely a mask. Like if you can afford nothing else, get a mask. And if you can't afford nothing else, in general, if you're on a budget, this is a bit difficult. It's Hema is kind of an expensive hobby, or can get expensive pretty quickly. But yeah, mask. If you have nothing else, a wooden sword can be okay, but I would personally highly recommend to go with a, a synthetic practice sword over that, uh, a, a nylon blade. So the problem with wood is it's not as durable. So even if it's cheaper to get one at first, it'll probably break eventually and you have to buy another one anyway. And two wooden swords are probably the same as a a nylon practice sword, or three at least. Plus, they are more dangerous because a, a wooden blade is rigid, you can't really do safe thrusts, it doesn't have the same kind of weight. The synthetic trainers can have the same weight as, as steel swords, or at least close. For synthetic blades, I would recommend either Purple Heart Armory or Black Fencer. They both have their pros and cons. I think the, the blades that Purple Heart makes are a little better. Uh, but the hilts that Black Fencer makes are better, so they have their pros and cons, but they're both absolutely usable and uh, reasonably affordable, so I would definitely suggest getting some of these. If you can afford it, of course, a steel practice sword is a good investment. Uh, this here is an Ensifer long sword. These are among the best. Uh, Regenie is also a good choice. And uh, yeah, again, I'm, I'm just gonna post a few links down below, recommendations. So yeah, that's as far as equipment is concerned, hand protection of course, also is very important. I made a video about that, reviewing a few gloves slash gauntlets. That'll be down below as well. So if you want to do sparring, especially intense full contact sparring, aside from head and throat protection, most important is joint protection. You definitely want elbow guards, knee guards, because if you take a sword to the side of the patella, then it's it's over for quite a while. Or if you get if you get struck on tendons and ligaments, you're screwed for a long time, possibly for the rest of your life, because stuff like that never heals properly. And you you know safety first, health first. I I will harp on this for quite a bit uh, and several times in this video. Uh, other than than that, you know, a, getting a jacket is also a good idea. Oh, a cup. <laughs> Do not save on money for a cup if you want to do sparring, otherwise this is going to happen to you. You don't want that. Protect your junk. And if you're a female practitioner, you may also want to get a chest guard, because apparently there's some research showing that repeated bruising of the breast tissue can increase the risk of breast cancer. So yeah, protect the vulnerable squishy parts, let's put it that way. Uh, Jacket is also a good idea if we want to do sparring. You might be able to get away with something like this. This is uh, motorcycle gear. This is uh, pretty affordable stuff from Gearbest. And uh, I'm planning to make a video about that at some point. So it's got hard plates. This also has shoulder and elbow protection and protection for the spine. That's definitely a good idea. You may need some more padding underneath but something like this could work. A lot of people also use hockey gear for protection, especially here in Canada. Just gotta remember to lubricate it with maple syrup. And that can work, but uh, stuff like the hockey gloves aren't ideal because they don't give you the same kind of uh, mobility. Like flexibility is better in lacrosse gloves. So lacrosse gloves are a good idea, but, but I talked about that in another video. So enough about equipment. Let's talk about how to do it. So first up, this is a mistake that a lot of people make. I did that myself before I joined a Kima school. Don't do too much sparring. Like don't start out with just sparring. I know that's that can be the most fun part and that's what you want to do, but 
don't don't do just that. You you won't learn much doing that. You have to learn the technique first, and then you can try to apply it in sparring, and then you can see does this work in real life, so to speak, uh, against a, a fully resistant opponent. It is important, absolutely, do sparring. In fact, I would say if you don't do sparring at all, you're doing it wrong. I mean, if you don't do it because you cannot afford all the protective gear you need for it to be safe, that's a different story. But if you deliberately choose not to do sparring because, oh, we don't need it, no, you're not doing it properly because then you won't find out if this actually works and if your uh, interpretation of the technique is viable. Because you can, you can make all kinds of weird things seem like they work against a compliant partner, but if you put it to the test, then it'll fall apart. So it is definitely important to do that. But the first step is read the manuals, you know, watch videos, etc., all of that kind of thing, to try to understand the technique, maybe, you know, compare different uh, interpretations, and practice those techniques first with a partner, you know, nice and slow and controlled, and pay attention to the, the little details of you know, footwork and posture, and, um, you know, see how it works then, and practice that quite a bit before you test it in sparring. Because if you, if you like try an interpretation of a technique for half an hour and then you use it in sparring, and it's like, oh, this doesn't work, it doesn't mean that the interpretation is bad, it just means that you haven't practiced it enough. Like, if you can't do it well, then it doesn't matter how good the technique is, you're not going to be successful with it. So, keeping that in mind, so it's a lot of practice, a lot of drills. The correct motto here is not practice makes perfect, but practice makes permanent. This is also why I'm saying don't just jump into sparring and do nothing else, because you'll develop a lot of bad habits, and if you solidify those habits, then it'll take that much more time to unlearn those and learn new, better patterns. So definitely important. You will have to go through that either way because interpretations change and you may, as you learn more, you may find out that this thing that you used to do is suboptimal and this new thing is better now. But you want to try to minimize that. Now, again, safety. I cannot preach this enough. There are certain things that you absolutely have to keep in mind. Like, for example, do not strike people hard on the head over and over again. It doesn't matter what they're wearing. It doesn't matter what kind of helmet or, or mask or whatever they have. Do not hit them as hard as you can in the head, ever. Not inspiring either. It's dangerous. And don't do the macho thing of, oh, you're just gonna toughen up. If you get knocked out, you get back up. <sighs> no, you will regret that later in life because brain damage is cumulative and irreversible. So if you get hit in the head over and over again, or if you suffer concussions repeatedly, the thing is you cannot toughen up to that. You cannot, you know, just all oh, man up and, and just learn to take it. Your brain will not learn to take it. In fact, both studies and empirical evidence from MMA and such have shown that you get more susceptible to getting knocked out. You know, the more concussions you have, the lower the, the threshold becomes for getting a concussion. Your brain becomes more and more vulnerable to concussion and brain damage, and the, the brain tissue will stretch over time. This is also one of the problems with HEMA gear. There is nothing really that can 100% prevent a concussion. Even if you have like a very good helmet that prevents a skull fracture, if your head is suddenly violently knocked around and jerked around, this will stretch the brain tissue, and that's what causes the damage. That's what causes concussion and all of that. Apparently more so than the brain bouncing against the skull, as far as newer research has shown. Either way, it's not good. Be mindful of that. And in general, be careful with your training partners. Now, of course, in sparring you want to fight with intent. You don't just want to do these, these, these little taps because they're not martially viable. But at the same time, you still need to keep your opponents or your training partners' uh, safety in mind. You don't want to wreck them, you don't want to cause you know, soft tissue damage and all of that. There is a certain risk involved, but there is risk in all sports. So a lot of the historical techniques do involve strikes to the head, because 
It is one of the most incapacitating things you can do in real combat. So you will have to hit people in the head, absolutely. But, you know, do it reasonably. Like, don't go full buffalo on them and, and try to smack them to bits. The other warning that I have to give you is do not do wrestling in sparring if you have not practiced it intensely and learned it from uh, some kind of qualified instructor. This can be really dangerous because the problem is no protective gear can can save you from torn ligaments and, and you know dislocated joints and things like that. This is how I wrecked my knee and I'm still dealing with that. It's it's going to be with me for the rest of my life because a ligament was torn. It does not heal on its own. Surgery only has a 50% chance of fixing that. This is the kind of stuff that you're dealing with if you're reckless. You know, it, all it takes is one misstep and you're done. Now, I don't want to scare you away from HEMA. I, I know that it, this may sound like, oh no, you're gonna get hurt and then you're gonna suffer from the rest of, for the rest of your life and don't do this. No, if you're being responsible, if you're doing it properly, the risk really isn't very high. In fact, the risk of playing soccer is higher as far as I see it. But you do need to keep these things in mind. Grappling, wrestling can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. So only do it if you have qualified instruction. Also, warm up before practice. Again, this is something that I used to not do before joining a HEMA school, but this is important. You don't want to jump into stuff like this if your muscles and tendons, etc., aren't properly warmed up. So, you know, stuff like jogging, uh, push-ups, sit-ups, you know, leg raises, what have you. There are a number of, of warm-up routines that you can do, including dynamic stretching. Dynamic stretching, there's the focus here. If you do static stretching, like where you just hold something for for a while, that's, that's not a good idea. Studies have shown that it increases your injury risk. So dynamic stretching is, you know, for example, to, to stretch your, your pecs, you would do stuff like this, you know, or, you know, bouncing your shoulders, rolling your shoulders, things like that. There are routines for that, and that's important. And finally, a healthy dose of humility is always a good idea. Be, always be willing to re-examine what you're doing, be open to constructive criticism. You know, if, if somebody comes along who has different ideas, different interpretations, even if they're less experienced than you are, have an open mind, consider what they have to say, and, you know, maybe try it out with them and see how does this work. And if you if you know that something is not efficient you know, biomechanically, explain it to people. You know, don't just say, nope, this is wrong, we don't do that. Um, always good to have open communication and all of that, and it'll help you improve over time. Like, don't be stuck in your ways. Uh, at Blunt Iron, for example, uh, since I joined, there have been several revisions of, you know, footwork and particular techniques when the, the interpretations have been refined and where the instructors have found that, okay, this actually works better you know, in tournaments. Since we've done this, we've, we've been doing better stuff like this and, and you know, re-examine, re-evaluate, improve, learn, grow, all of that good stuff. And I think that covers all the essential basics, uh, maybe except one concern that people sometimes have is physical fitness. You know, how fit do I have to be to do this? You know, I have this or that issue, like I'm overweight or I'm injured or etc. all of this. And the general answer is don't worry too much about it. You know, if you get into it, um, any kind of physical exercise is going to help you and don't feel too self-conscious or pressured. I know that's easier said than done, but you know, there's always going to be somebody who is more physically fit and, you know, bigger and stronger and faster and more skilled, etc., etc., etc. And you don't have to be the best. You just, you don't have to be better than everybody else. You just have to be better than your past self. Beat yourself, grow, improve. This is really the important part and you will improve. If you put the time into it, if you put the effort into it, you will improve. You will get setbacks, that's natural, but you will get better over time. So don't, don't get discouraged. And uh, if you practice with the right people, it's going to be fine. You will uplift each other and you will motivate each other and you'll be okay. If you, if you can't do a single push-up, then fine, do something else. Some kind of variation like, like um, incline push-ups or something. You can, you can find 
other things to do that will you know build up your muscles and, and work you know work your way up to where you can do that so you don't really have to be worried about that um, some people at, at Bloodline, including myself have even done uh, chair drills occasionally you know when my, my knee injury was so bad that I, I couldn't I couldn't stand and walk properly I would sit on a chair and, and go through the guards and, and do you know cuts and parries and all of that there are, there are plenty of ways in which you can accommodate things like that so that's about it I don't have any more to say other than have fun and oh one, one more thing I, I've been thinking about setting up a patreon reward for people in this kind of situation who don't have access to a, a school or instructor etc and and set this up as a reward for people who can who can get like one-on-one -on -one feedback like say you record yourself doing a certain form or you know technique drill or whatever I review it give you feedback based on it and hopefully help you along the way so let me know if if you would be interested in that I uh, just want to gauge the kind of interest now this this would be mainly for beginners and kind of low intermediates like I'm, I'm not a HEMA master by any means but I'm intermediate at this point advanced however you want to call it and I've done some teaching at Blood and Iron so I can definitely help out beginners at the very least because I, I know how difficult it is to to get proper feedback and this can really help if somebody else looks at what you're doing they may see things that you don't and this can be helpful so let me know if you would be interested in that and also what you would consider a fair price for something like that now I know what instructors generally charge for one-on-one -on -one instruction I know what the the schools generally charge as monthly monthly fee but I still want to know from people like what would you consider fair so yeah let me know I might do that at some point if um, if people think that, that would help them otherwise yeah there's that links down below to equipment and all of that it's probably an overly long video but i hope it's helpful and thanks for watching have a good one folks